who do you say that I am? It truly is a question that goes down throughout the ages. It's really the central question of human life for these 2,000 some years. Who do you say that I am? The question that Jesus asked Peter is also the important question for us as well. Famously, C.S. Lewis, the Christian writer, said that there's really only three possible answers to that question. Because even though many people posit things, well, like he was a wise teacher or uh, he was a holy man teaching about different moral aspects of life, C.S. Lewis said, well, none of those really make sense if we look seriously at what the gospel says. He says that really it comes down to three categories. Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. Because the things he says about himself, comparing himself to God, confessing that, yes, he is the Son of God, well, if that wasn't true, then he's simply a liar or a lunatic. And so we shouldn't follow him because he's not a good man if he is lying about this. He's really just a human being. Or if he's just so crazy that he really thinks that he's the Son of God, well, uh, we wouldn't follow him for that reason either. But if we truly want to follow Jesus, if what he set himself to be and what others have proclaimed him to be, the fact that they, of course, saw him die but also rise from the dead, if all these things are true, then we must confess him as Lord. And this is the insight that Peter offers today, of course, that he truly is the Christ, the Son of God. Pope Benedict, writing before he was Pope, as Joseph Ratzinger, spoke about this fundamental question of Christianity, saying that the act of Christian faith has a tangible character that constitutes the most serious challenge to the leap of faith to believe that the fate of all history, our fate, depends on one individual, Jesus of Nazareth. He also would say that Christian faith is not, I believe in something, but I believe in you. We don't just confess a series of doctrines or truths of the faith. We ultimately confess a person, that Jesus Christ is truly God and man. And so that's what sets our faith apart. That was meant to be the center of our faith, to confess, yes, that Jesus is Lord. It shows that God is not simply some sort of impersonal force. He's not simply uh, kind of an angry judge. He's not simply kind of indifferent to human affairs, all different ways of conceptualizing God or viewing God. But no, God is very personal and intimate. God became man. He took flesh. He took on humanity in its fullness, and in doing so shows his great love for humanity, his great tenderness. And so it's by making this confession, if we truly confess that Jesus is Lord, we truly strive to live that out, that we receive really what Peter receives as well, albeit in our own way. What does Peter receive after he makes this great confession? Well, he receives both identity and authority. And each of us, too, in our own way, receive identity and authority whenever we confess that Jesus is Lord. Peter is told, blessed are you, because this has been revealed by the Heavenly Father. In other words, we can say that Peter is becoming the Son of God. Not Jesus is the Son of God, but through Jesus, a true son or daughter of God. And it's the same for us, that we, too, whenever we confess Jesus as Lord, Whenever we receive the sacrament of baptism, we have received a new identity. We truly can be called ourselves a Christian, right? After the name of Christ, after the name of the Messiah, we too take on that same name as following Christ as Christian. And so we take on this new identity. We also, though, receive a new authority as well. The identity of the Christian also gives us an authority that we are meant to live for Christ to speak for Christ, to act for Christ in the things that we do. So we see that there's a need for proper authority. Obviously, Peter gets a very specific kind of authority, the authority that he receives both as an apostle but now as the head of the church. But again, all of us uh, receive some type of authority in 
taking on the name of Christ. And so again, as Christians, we must understand that proper view of authority, to understand what it means, how to follow it, and the limits to human authority, because we confess Jesus as Lord. Here's what Peter says in his first letter, chapter number 2. In verse 13, he says, Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake. And he goes on to say in 16 and 17, Be free, yet without using that freedom as a pretext for evil, but as slaves of God. Give honor to all, love the community, fear God, honor the king. So what Peter is laying out for us is that we are meant to be, yes, subject to human authority. He speaks about honoring human institutions, honoring the king, honoring all, loving the community, loving one another, all parts of being a follower of Jesus, putting ourselves to rightful authority. And yet he also tells us to fear God and be slaves of God. And what does that mean? It means that as Christians, we're people who understand authority and following authority. We also say that no human authority is absolute. We confess that Jesus is Lord, and doing so means that in one sense, we are meant to be good, ser good servants, good citizens, good stewards of whatever we've been given in human ways. But in another sense, we are the most radical of all in terms of authority because we say that no human authority can come before God, that only God is the ultimate authority. And so when it comes to things which are truly matters of God, matters of salvation, matters of doing the will of God or not, we must always go to the Lord and do what the Lord asks of us. And so this is that relationship that we have with authority, respecting it and honoring it, but also recognizing its limitations in human terms. And so again, this shows us the need that there are times to understand the need for reforms that take place, that human authority is not absolute, and so that we can see there are times where there's needed reforms. But that's the opposite of saying, uh, on one hand, I'm going to always be subject to authority, I'm going to refuse to stand up against evil that is taking place, or in the opposite extreme, I'm going to reject all authority and do whatever I want. As Peter said in that letter, be free, but not with using freedom as a pretext for evil or as selfishness or simply doing what I want. And so we have that proper balance, the nuanced understanding of authority and how it works. Right? We see this in the church, that the Pope is given the keys to the kingdom, as it speaks about in our first reading today as well. But he's being given that keys as the vicar of Christ, one of his titles of the Pope. The vicar means someone who is standing in place of, like a prime minister. He's underneath the king. Just as I am called a parochial vicar, it means I'm not the pastor, but I assist the pastor. I've been given authority by him, but ultimately he is the one in authority in a parish. And so we see what that means, that he is the steward of the church, someone who has to do what the church uh, calls him to do, called to pass on the tradition of the church. It doesn't mean that uh, everything the Pope does is going to be right or moral, so they always make good decisions. It doesn't mean there's not a need for reforms. There's a number of reforms or things that could take place at the Vatican right now. The fact that we're waiting still for the McCarrick report on Cardinal McCarrick that was said to be coming out of the Vatican uh, for years now still hasn't been released. You know, the relationship with China, there's things that we can criticize the Vatican or even Pope Francis for, but we still recognize his true authority. On the opposite extreme are those, uh, like recently, a priest who denied that Francis is the, truly the Pope, and he was excommunicated, and rightfully so. Right? We have to respect the Pope's authority, even when we see needs for reform or for change. As opposed to that, we can see someone, I think, who really did have a heart for reform and did have to stand up in a difficult way to her bishop, and that was a woman named uh, Shaven O'Connor, that she worked for the Bishop of Buffalo, Bishop Malone at the time, and she knew that there were a number of, that well, there was a report released about uh, a history of abusive priests. She knew that there were a number of names that were not on that list that really should have been. And she first went to the bishop, whom she respected, who she liked, 
and told him, what, what about this person? What about that person? Why are they not listed in the report? And he would you know, put her off and say, I'm taking care of it, it'll work out. But she saw consistently it was not happening time after time. So eventually she, in her conscience, said, I can't let this information continue to be silenced. And she actually released it to a reporter that she had access to some of the files and gave them to a reporter. Now, we can ask whether that was the right thing. Was she in some way not respecting the authority of the bishop? But when the bishop refused to release the full truth, even though he was saying that this was you know, the abuse reports that had been received by the diocese, she was standing up for the truth. I think she really did something proper and right in that respect. So again, we see the healthy balance between respect for authority, but also at the same time, recognizing the limits of authority, of human authority, and that God's authority is ultimate. Again, we can see a similar thing in civil society. Certainly there's a need for reforms in many aspects of life, for example, in criminal justice. And there are ways that the police you know, need to be reformed. But at the same time, you know, saying that we want to defund or the police seems like a pretty bad idea to me. Uh, that we can't get rid of the prisons or the court system. But there are certainly reforms needed. I think of a group called the Innocence Project, which actually helps people uh, to study their cases to see if they actually were innocently uh, imprisoned. And there's one case going on right now, Purvis Payne, who's scheduled to be executed uh, later this year. Well, his case went, went, he's always claimed innocence, and his case happened before DNA testing was prevalent in the 80s. And so he's asked for DNA testing on, on the evidence, but so far the courts have denied him and the district attorney has said we sh shouldn't test the results for DNA. Well, that's really an injustice. And if we really want a justice, why, what would hurt to test this DNA to give us you know, better knowledge to see for sure whether he's truly guilty of this crime? You know, this is one way that we could have reforms in our criminal justice system. So we see the need for reforms and we see the need to work for changes, but they must take place still with respect for authority, not by simply saying we can get away or do away with all authority and do whatever we would like. And so all this brings us back to what Peter had received and that we too receive as followers of Jesus. That who do we say Jesus is? We should, if we truly confess him as the Son of God, then we receive our identity as those beloved sons and daughters of God as those Christians, but we also receive authority just to stand up for the truth. That anywhere the truth is, that is where Christ is. So we need to be those people who stand for the truth, to respect authority, but also to point to the need for reforms in various ways in our society. So identity and authority. This is what we receive as sons and daughters of our King. This is what we receive whenever we strive to respect and honor those around us. This is what we receive, and we must always remember that, that we truly take on the name of Christ every time that we live and act, because we are Christians, sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father.